So that's fantastic. Okay, off you go. Okay, so I just thought um, I would just speak um, with you just briefly about this concept of um, personal learning networks because that's something that we um, we didn't quite get time to um, get to last week and that it's some it's sort of connected to that idea of learning in community but a, a more a different way of learning with others and a different uh, way of understanding social learning. So we thought that we would just have very short amount of input and then give you guys some opportunity to um, discuss in your in your breakout groups and to share, um, you know, what you have been uh, discovering and learning about and talking about and what you feel that um, this particular area of the course ha might have contributed to your learning. And then we might just have a little bit at the end where we can come back together and have some feedback and sharing of what was happening in the groups. And um, so I, I, I'm interested to know how many people are familiar or have or are used to the term personal learning network. Is that something that um, is completely new to you or is it something that you've heard of before? Any, you can say in the chat or just grab the mic if you like, because it's such a small group, you can just jump on if you like. For me, it's totally new. Uh, I haven't heard about this. Okay. Okay, great. And um, Anna said it's a new concept for her too. So... Um, others might have heard of it because it is something that um, it gets used a little bit, but um, a lot of the research uh, about personal learning networks is actually um, being conducted looking at school teachers. Um, and so it's um, there's less research looking at personal learning networks in amongst academics, which is interesting because um, as someone who was a school teacher and who is now an academic, um, and I and being involved in this type of area of research, I can definitely see ways that um, academics can most definitely um, benefit. But also, I can see how a personal learning network might be something that is just too much in amongst the busyness of everything else. Ah, Fazane has heard of it because of Twitter. Yes, and Twitter is a very um, big uh, tool in the personal network. Um, arena, I guess it's one of the core tools that lots of people use. Um, but before I get down into talking about tools, I, because it's new for some people, basically a personal learning network is nothing new. It's people have always had networks of people that they've relied upon, um, collegial networks, people that you might talk to when you have um, a question uh, or you've got a problem or perhaps uh, you would like to celebrate an achievement. You know, you yell out down the hallway, hey, I got my paper published or um you might say, hey, I, I'm really, I've got this student and they're, they're really struggling with this point. Have you ever had a, um, a situation like this and how did you handle it? Um, we've always had those people around us collegially, but um, because of the technologies that we have today and social technologies, we have the opportunity to be able to develop these networks much more broadly and to develop these networks in a way that um, it doesn't even have to necessarily rely on people being in the same discipline or um, even in the same career at all. So the personal learning networks that I'm interested in are these online networks where people make connections to other people, but also to information and uh, resources that are shared by other people. Ultimately, it's all driven by people, um, but enabled by this technology. And the networks that I have looked at and studied have been, um, I call them personal learning networks, although some people call them professional learning networks because they're used in this case for um, the purposes of professional learning. But I call them personal because they're, they're very much the network that is of one individual person. One person will drive the network and design the network and create the connections that they would like in order to further their own goals. And that's like last week I talked about the differences between networks and communities, where communities, not always, but tend to be a group of people that have come together with some shared goals and perhaps um, some, some, um, um, some intent to 
support each other in the learning process, that, um, that a network is much more autonomous, that it's much more about connecting with other individuals or resources according to that individual's needs. And along the way, there, there can be some reciprocity and you might there might be a little bit of community that is built temporarily, but it's not necessarily a connection, uh, a series of connections between people that are very, very close. Um, and so I'm talking about very informal learning when I talk about this type of professional learning, but it can be also like all of these things, there's always blend across different concepts. So um, as much as it is mostly informal learning because it's driven by the individual, um, there can be opportunities like this course is a little bit more formalized, um, but it will help you evolve your network of people that you know from all over the world. So and they will be colleagues that uh, have been drawn to the concepts in ONL. They might, might not be in your specific field. Um, at this point with from ONL, nearly everyone is um, an academic or a librarian working at a university, but you might find later that your network expands to include people who are even in completely different fields. And so before, um, before I let you go off into your into your groups, I just wanted to quickly talk about some of the challenges that can um, that can happen as a part of learning in this way, because it's um, it's very easy to talk about the benefits and the and the, the strengths of this learning, because I can share lots of stories about connections that I've made where I've been able to ask a person. A question where, for example, when I'm researching something, if I'm finding um, a challenging part of a paper, I might feel because I have the confidence built up over time with my networks that I can reach out to that author using social technologies and ask the author specifically um, to explain or to explain what they were thinking when they were writing that or explain the issue that I'm having difficulty with. Whereas, and especially I guess being in Australia, but once upon a time that would have been pretty much impossible. You know, you wouldn't really write a letter and put it in the envelope and post it off to an author of a research paper. You kind of need an answer a little bit more quickly than that. Um, these it the the connections that we make and this through social technologies can be very democratizing we can feel like we can connect people who might be able to help us and what have we got to lose you know if we're polite if we've built up a little bit of um a little bit of um um per person the presence online um we can ask and the individual can choose either to reply or they can choose that they are too busy, they didn't see the post, they didn't want to explain it, or, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons. And as long as you go about the process, you know, with respect, then, um, then you know, there's no harm in asking the question or making the connection. Um, however, the fact that we can connect with everyone all over the world, one of the, one of the challenges is infowhelm and can become just overwhelmed by not only the amount of information that is available, but uh, also the number of choices that we have. Who, who do we listen to? Who do we connect with? How do we evaluate this information? And Anna, I was interested, you said you're a teacher librarian, because my, that's my um, le I lecture and, um, and the course director in teacher librarianship. And I think that's one of the things, the skills that we should be teaching students from a very early age is critical analysis and evaluation of information so that they perhaps don't feel quite so overwhelmed. I think we'll always feel overwhelmed. Um, I read somewhere that I, we take in more information just looking at, you know, um, one's one screen of Twitter, we take that's more information than a Victorian woman would have taken in in her entire existence living in, in a, a upper class Victorian society. Um, I think it's normal that we feel overwhelmed, but if we have skills to help us with our evaluations, it can help. And the same with time management it can be really easy to fall down a rabbit hole and um, get distracted or go off on a tangent get involved in a conversation or something online that is not really um, aligned with where our goals are for that period of time or that day. Um, and th this is a skill that I think we, we underestimate is that ability to manage our attention and manage our time so that 
we almost need to develop little personal rules for ourselves to, I, I will look at this for a set amount of time or I will engage for with so many people and then I will stop. And, then, and in my research with school teachers, I did find that they, some people who engaged quite heavily with PLNs had developed some of these little informal rules and practices for themselves. And then there's always the question of quality, credibility and authenticity. And obviously this is a huge area because it covers the whole idea of misinformation, um, disinformation, malinformation, the whole fake news scenario. But also as academics, there's always the questions about, you know, how do we know when we when we have a paper that's been published in a journal, technically that that should be a proof that it's been checked by referees and um, and it's and it's gone through a process prior to publication to check for quality. But if we're looking at blogs and we're looking at uh, articles that have been published online, there's far far fewer checks. And so we do need to be aware of those skills um, and we need to develop our um, capacity to understand the models and the publishing models behind these tools. For example, some people are very suspicious of Wikipedia. I know school teachers often say to students, you know, don't use Wikipedia when you're, ref when you're researching for your assignment. Um, and yet Wikipedia can be an incredible source. It's more about how you use it, whether you use it to get that background information and find the references that take you, lead you deeper into the, um, the, the discipline or the, the area that they're, being, they're writing about, or do you just take the surface value? And in fact, Wikipedia has been found to be incredibly accurate. So there's that argument as well. And finally, I think something that is um, can be a blessing and a curse is managing a digital identity that's professional. And this is something that if we are going to engage online in personal and professional learning networks that, um, that we are very much aware that everything we say online is um, obviously it's there's a record of it. And this can come crashing into people's careers with very negative and we see all, every day there's someone who, who regrets a statement or regrets a photo having been shared, um, but also a great opportunity for us to develop uh, a reputation as a leader in a field or as an insightful, um, insightful expert or person in, uh, who knows about a particular topic, um, create those connections with others that help us build, um, build evidence of, of who we are. And I think the, the real key to that is to go into the personal learning network with a strategic sort of focus. So just almost deciding who am I when I am going to be online in different spaces, um, when I'm a visitor, when I'm a resident, who am I, how do I behave, how do I want others to perceive me? Um, and I'm not suggesting that we create a fake persona, but that we recognize just like when we walk into the office where we sort of put on a, a person who's slightly different to the person that we are when we walk into our lounge room at home, um, that we need to be conscious of, of that, uh, the same thing in, in, the, in the public online space. And so um, this area, as I said, there's a lot less information and research about how academics might use personal learning networks uh, and a lot more in schools because it seems like teachers have adopted this um, as a way of being able to connect with other teachers. Um, but I'm really interested in looking at how academics might, um, might build and uh, use these networks and whether they consider all of these different aspects of their networks, or whether they sort of, it, it just happens um, either naturally or whether it happens um, by mistake, uh, whether it happens, you know, just, just through interactions and they're not really conscious even of this, so they've sort of got an invisible footprint. Um, and so I'm actually going to start doing some research in this area and especially looking at how people have, um, have been able to enhance their digital pedagogy and their digital knowledge over this last couple of years with COVID because it's been even more so that we need to network even when we're, even with people who we normally might be face to face with. So that's a, a lot of information in a very short time. So it might be a good ch chance now for you to um, 
have some time to discuss with each other. Um, but you might want to share how you've been working with this topic in your groups and sharing with each other that you might bring back some input to the others who haven't been able to make it today to talk about what you've learned during this topic. I mean, when we spend these very short periods of time, it's really more of a taster, more of a dip into these topics. So may, maybe identifying what you'd like to learn more about, what you, what you already feel confident in and what areas are new to you. So I think Alistair is in charge of the technology to break everyone into the little group. Yep, we've got a uh, group set up, so uh, I'll send you out. Uh, you'll be mixed as usual uh, from different uh, study groups. And um, actually, I'll give you 25 minutes because we'd like to get a little bit of feedback when you come back again before we finish. So um, if that's all right with you, I will send you away. Okay, welcome, welcome back. Yeah. Go on, Kate. Welcome back, everyone. Sounds like you were having very uh, full on discussions in your in your groups, because um, as Alistair was saying, no one came back early, everyone waited till the last second. So I um, was just wondering if maybe group one wanted to share what you were having a discussion about. Who is group one actually? <laughs> yeah. Who is group sure one? Ah, good <laughs> point. Oh, Anna that's our Den that's our group. Yeah, Anna that's Denise right. and Osman. Anna Denise. Uh, there was one other person, but I'm not sure who's. Uh, she, she, had to leave. To, she had to leave. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so I think I'll just uh, present on behalf of the group. So, what we uh, discussed just now, we 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 talk about the about cooperative learning, about collaborative learning, and then about needing an icebreaker for, for it to start uh, so, so that everyone is comfortable with each other before they work with one another. Then there was also somebody who said that there's also limitations of group work. Okay, what can we do if there's a limitation of group work? For example, there's people who can present, there's people who can do research. So we say that, oh, there should be complementary and they should complement each other. So if there's they are good in one and uh, one area. They can concentrate on in one area, and then after that, if they're good in another area, they do it in that area. Then we, but the thing is, the the teacher, the teacher's role is important because as a facilitator, because you need to assign roles, so you can't do the same roles all the time. So although the the group work, they they can have, they be good at something, for example. But once you assign roles, the next project they will do another role. Yeah. So, and uh, there's also a, a comment on that group learning consists of individuals that learn. And then uh, some are there who are just present and some are free, free riders. And then how do we react to that? So how, how can we make this collaborative learning better when there's only some people who actually uh, contribute? And then uh, there's also, uh, from from the learning uh, for the past few years, there's also a, a, a noticeable difference between network and community learning, and and it's a process and it needs to take time to develop for better progression. Yeah, and then uh, then it's it's better for have uh, to have a collaborative learning uh, collaborated in a safe community so that they are better able to network. And for the and for the network on community learning, it, because it's a process and it needs time to develop, so it's better for a longer program to do uh, collaborative learning so that we can see the progression. Yeah, mm. that's what yeah, mm. we we learned from the group discussion just now. Yes, it goes into this sort of what we we're talking about in topic two that uh, sometimes you can be more open in a community that is safe. <laughs> And that safe community can be quite restricted or even closed. But 
openness and security and openness and trust are sort of linked to each other. And it's hard to be open in your discussion if you feel that there are maybe hostile forces or there are people out there who may not, who you don't trust. So we've got a, we've got a, ba a balance between trust and security and openness and collaboration. Mm. Definitely, definitely. Group two, did you share things on a similar line or different? Yeah, we uh, we just exchanged the experiences we had in each of our groups, and there were other different experiences uh, mentioning. Uh, that it could be like the experience of having a group that is very much outcome focused and discussing mm. terms and being very academic and just getting the getting the task done <laughs> to to having very much focusing on on what Alan, Alistair mentioned here then the, to create the safety and, and outcomes that can be both of the mind and of the heart uh, for the group work and uh, calling that harvest and and uh, discussing and letting the group decide themselves what would we want to have as our harvest for for the group work to um, to experiences of uh, uh, like uh, how could technology aid us uh, in 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 giving some markers of how we could measure the process like mm, a technology mm. approach about that uh, especially on your own line that you could have some sort of analytics about what is actually defining like we saw in, in breakout rooms now you can measure the activity or you could see the activity when you're a host um, and going then from this technology approach of uh, the process realization also over to something that uh, Jonna was talking about, that they're producing a guideline uh, for group work. And uh, we, I think we rounded it up by discussing is, is, this, is, is the, the assignments and the instructions that are given in the ONL course, this course we are in, are, are they good enough? <laughs> To, to facilitate or to 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 uh, generate this kind of good group work or or um, is there some things uh, that need to be added and uh, yeah. included in that that, that these kind of uh, meta reflection uh, invitations that you have like this they are very helpful was there mm. Prasanna, Jonna and Marva is there anything that you yeah okay So, yeah, about that. Good enough, Marcus. Thank you for summarizing the points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, see, um, looking at the process as well as the outcome is always really interesting. And sometimes I think we can learn more from the process and that uh, in university or even in school, sometimes we can place too much emphasis on the outcome and not enough on the process. And, you know, when we unfortunately have to place a score or a grade at the end, it can be much, e much easier just to reduce it down to just getting stuff done to get to that end point rather than spending time and getting the value out of the process as well. So thank you for that. That's great. Well, it's nearly time to wrap up, but were there any other questions or comments before we end? tonight's session. I, I had one reflection there listening to you and I found that interesting the distinction you made between networks and communities and you were also mm. mentioning the reciprocity. So yeah. uh, so it's like a spectrum isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I wonder uh, well it's you know that is uh, on this axis what could be on that axis so that you have four quadrants <laughs> but is is uh, have, is it like if I want to help you and you want to help me, that's a sort of reciprocity. But another way yes. is then if there is a shared interest in our in, in what we have. And um, yeah, I'm just uh, wondering if uh, what could be helpful as a distinction here in, in understanding and making the distinctions. I think, I think that what I really like about um, the v Wenger's, um, he talked about um, the networks and communities being different threads of the same fabric because there's so much overlay. There's the, there's elements of community in networks and there's elements of network and community and you can be in a network and have that reciprocity and build that, that sense of community 
but uh, it's still a network because there still might be people coming in and out and there still might be an element of aut autonomous, you know, goal setting or, you know, but then, and, and serendipity, but then, you know, so I, I, I really like that way of understanding it, that there's no, that there's differences, but that they, they exist in, in, in one, one fabric. Mm. Maybe there is also like something like passive and active in, in networks and communities. Like when there is yeah. a crisis or if you feel not good, so the community can or the network can carry you or bring you to new ideas or something like that. And then again, you, if you are very active, you can contribute to hel helping others or, or carrying others. So it, it's this kind of um, uh, social or in a way like active or passive status yeah. that you can be a part of a community you don't have to be always like the super no. active one so definitely and, and I feel like that was part of some of the research findings that I have was that um, the people who were the most active seem to get the greatest outcomes but that for some people who were less active they were looking for different. They were looking for different outcomes, and the and the less active um, was all that they needed to meet their own needs. And it was that's the very nature of it being a personal learning network. Is the biggest, the biggest, most impressive outcomes seem to come from when people were much more active. But that doesn't mean that they were always active, or that being active is the only way to mm. exist in that space. Mm. Mm. And related to David White's sort of residence uh, and uh, the, his his model there that we move in and out, that some networks were very active, other uh, or, or communities, and other communities were a little bit um, just passive and uh, watching, and we can move mm. between these. And sometimes we're active, and sometimes we're not. And the challenge is when you want to start a community around a particular problem, it's easy to get people to join, but then how do you light the spark? How do you get people contributing? And you find that with so many Facebook groups and other, you know, the LinkedIn groups, there's two or three people who are, who are active and the rest are, they're happy. They're, they're passively watching, they're getting good ideas, but they never contribute. And, how do you get to that tipping what point when it really becomes a community? Mm. Mm. And whether that can actually even be artificially created or whether it just has to, yeah. whether the environment just has to be just right for it to. Okay, I think we have to, we have to close the shop for now and uh, yes. we thank you for being here and uh, those of you watching the recording hope you've got a little bit of ideas out of this minus the discussion but uh, next on Sunday we open up topic four about designing online and blended learning and there will be more interesting webinars then so lovely thanks, to meet Kate. you all no problem have a great day